The Pearl, Chapter 6 The wind blew fierce and strong, and it pelted them with bits of sticks, sand, and little rocks. Juana and Kino gathered their clothing tighter about them and covered their noses and went out into the world. The sky was brushed clean by the wind, and the stars were cold in a black sky. The two walked carefully, and they avoided the center of the town, where some sleeper in a doorway might, might see them pass. For the town closed itself in against the night, and anyone who moved about in the darkness would be noticeable. Kino threaded his way around the edge of the city and turned north, north by the stars, and found the rutted or kind of grooved sandy road that led through the brushy country towards Loretto, where the miraculous virgin has her station. So he's headed north in Mexico towards the town of Loreto. Kino could feel the blown sand against his ankles, and he was glad, for he knew there would be no tracks, so the wind is going to blow away their footsteps, so there's no tracks to be followed. The little light from the stars made... The little light from the stars made out for him the narrow road through the brushy country. So brushy is going to mean like it's it's like scrub brush, like those kind of not very bushy bushes that grow in the desert. So be imagining that there's sand, it's the desert. If you've been um, east of LA, like way east where it starts to become desert, you probably have a good picture of that in your mind. And Kino could hear the pad of Juana's feet be behind him, so he can hear her footsteps. He went quickly and quietly, and Juana trotted behind him to keep up. Some ancient thing stirred in Kino. Through his fear of dark and the devils that haunt the night, there came a rush of exhilaration. He's excited. Some animal thing was moving in him so that he was cautious and wary or very aware and dangerous. Some ancient thing out of the past of his people was alive in him. The wind was at his back and the stars guided him. The wind cried and whisked in the brush. And the family went on monotonously without changing, hour after hour. They passed no one and saw no one. At last, to their right, the waning moon arose. Waning means it was, it was becoming less full, so it's more like a crescent moon. And when it came up, the wind died down, and the land was still. Now they could see the little road ahead of them, deep cut with sand-drifted wheel tracks. With the wind gone, there would be footprints, but they were a good distance from the town, and perhaps their tracks might not be noticed. Kino walked carefully in a wheel rut, and Juana followed in his path. One big cart going to the town in the morning could wipe out every trace of their passage, Let's take a look at wheel ruts in, video, uh, in picture form, just so that you have an idea of what that looks like. So wheel ruts, this is a good, a good picture here. It's gonna have kind of like a long shallow hole in the ground. Here's another really good version where the ground was soft enough to leave the imprint of the wheel going through it. So Kino is walking in this on purpose because other wheels are going to go in that rut as well. So his footprints are going to be covered by the tracks of the wheels. So um, one big cart going to the town in the morning could wipe out every trace of their passage. All night they walked and never changed their pace. They kept going at the same speed. Once Coyotito awakened and Juana shifted him in front of her and soothed him until he went to sleep again, and the evils of the night were about them. The coyotes cried and laughed in the brush, and the owls screeched and hissed over their heads, and once some large animal lumbered away, crackling the undergrowth as it went. And Kino gripped the handle of the big working knife and took a sense of protection from it. The music of the pearl was triumphant in Kino's head. It was winning or had a winning mood to it, and the quiet melody of the family underlay it, and they wove themselves into the soft padding of sandaled feet in the dust. So we're hearing both the music of the pearl and the music of the family. So they're mixed together with the sound of their feet on the ground. All night they walked, 
and in the first dawn, Kino searched the roadside for a covert to lie in during the day. So he was trying to look for basically a ditch or just some area where they could be kind of covered. He found his place near to the road, a little clearing where deer might have lain, and it was curdened thickly with the dry, brittle trees that lined the road. And when Juana had seated herself and had settled to nurse or breastfeed the baby, Kino went back to the road. He broke a branch and carefully swept the footprints where they had turned from the roadway, so he's using the branch almost as a broom. And then, in the first light, he heard the creak of a wagon, and he crouched beside the road and watched a heavy two-wheeled cart go by, drawn by slouching oxen, which are, are large farm animals, almost like a, a bull. So it's a two-wheeled cart being drawn by a bull of, of sorts. And when it had passed out of sight, he went back to the roadway and looked at the rut and found that the footprints were gone, just as he had planned. And again, he swept out his traces and went back to Juana. So they should be safe. They, they walked during the wind when the wind was blowing away their footprints. And then they walked in the rut. And now this wagon has gone over their footprints in the rut. And he has swept out all remaining footprints. So she gave him the soft corn cakes Apollonia had packed for them, and after a while she slept a little. But Kino sat on the ground and stared at the earth in front of him. He watched the ants moving, a little column of them near his foot, and he put his foot in their path. Then the column climbed over his instep, the kind of space between your toes and your heel, and continued on its way, and Kino left his foot there and watched them move over it. Now this is interesting, because we have... Kino being characterized in this very subtle way where he he's getting in the way of the ants, but he's not killing them. He's just letting them walk on him. Think, of, think about that. Just hold that in your mind as we move forward. The sun arose hotly. They were not near the gulf now, and the air was dry and hot so that the brush cricked with heat. It made like a sound, and a good resinous or sap smell came from it. And when Juana wakened when the sun was high, Kino told her things she already knew. Beware of that kind of tree there, he said, pointing. Do not touch it, for if you do and then touch your eyes, it will blind you. And beware of the tree that bleeds. See that one over there. For if you break it, the red blood will flow from it, and it is evil luck. And she nodded and smiled a little at him, for she knew these things. Now, Juana smiles at him because she's very nice. Everyone else you're thinking, that's mansplaining and probably giving him a side eye. But as we've discovered before, Juana lets him take lead and she kind of steps back and lets him be the man. Will they follow us, she asked. Do you think they will try to find us? They will try, said Kino. Whoever finds us will take the pearl. Oh, they will try. And Juana said, Perhaps the dealers were right and the pearl has no value. Perhaps this has all been an illusion. An illusion is, is a trick that your eyes can play on you. Kino reached into his clothes and brought out the pearl. He let the sun play on it until it burned in his eyes. No, he said. They would not have tried to steal it if it had been valueless. Do you know who attacked you? Was it the dealers? Now, this... Here you see, this is Juana speaking, but it's missing what's called a dialogue tag. The dialogue tag is everywhere where it says he said or she said and such and such. This we know is Juana talking because she's the only one who's there who can talk. Coyotito is still an infant baby. So this is Juana. And this you'll see a lot in your reading where you just have to sort of figure out who's speaking based on the context. So she's asking, was it the dealers? I do not know, he said. I didn't see them. He looked into his pearl to find his vision. When we sell it at last, I will have a rifle, a gun, he said. And he looked into the shining surface for his rifle, almost like a crystal ball. But he saw only a huddled, dark body on the ground with shining blood dripping from its throat. And he said quickly, we will be married in a great church. And in the pearl, he saw Juana with her beaten face crawling home through the night. Our son must learn to read, he said frantically in like a worried rush. And there in the pearl, Coyotito's face, 
thick and feverish from the medicine. And Kino thrust the pearl back into his clothing, and the music of the pearl had become sinister, sin evil in his ears, and it was interwoven with the music of evil. So the pearl song, which maybe at one point was hopeful and uplifting, and we're going to get married, and the well, boy's going to learn to read, now it has taken on this evil note. And now it's even mixing with the music of evil, the same music that played when Coyotita was stung with the scorpion. The hot sun beat on the earth so that Kino and Wano moved into the lacy shade of the brush, and small gray birds scampered and moved about on the ground in the shade. In the heat of the day, Kino relaxed and covered his eyes with his hat and wrapped his blanket about his face to keep the flies off, and he slept. But Wana did not sleep. She sat quiet as a stone, and her face was quiet. Her mouth was still swollen where Kino had struck her, where he had punched her, and big flies buzzed around the cut on her chin. But she sat there as still as a sentinel, like a guard. And when Coyote to awaken, she placed him on the ground in front of her and watched him wave his arms and kick his feet. And he smiled and gurgled and made that like cute little baby noise at her until she smiled too. She picked up a little twig from the ground and tickled him and she gave him water from the gourd she carried in her bundle. Now, in case you're wondering um, what a gourd looks like, a water gourd is gonna look like a, a regular, um, like cala calabacitas, right? Like a regular squash, and then you dry it, and it's hollow like this, so you can actually fill it with stuff. And um, you can use it for holding water like this. You can use it for holding all manner of things. It basically becomes a bowl. So she gave him water from the gourd she carried in her bundle in her bag. Kino stirred or moved about in a dream, and he cried out in a guttural voice, like in a deep voice. And his hand moved in symbolic fighting. And then he moaned and sat up suddenly, his eyes wide and his nostrils flaring, like his nose kind of fluffing out because he's having some feelings. He listened and heard only the cricking heat and the hiss of distance. What is it? Anna asked. Hush, he said. You were dreaming. Perhaps. But he was restless, and she gave him a corn cake from her store, from the, the stored st things, from her storage. And he paused in his chewing to listen. He was uneasy. He wasn't relaxed, and he was nervous. He glanced over his shoulder. He lifted the big knife and felt its edge. When Coyotito gurgled or made that baby noise on the ground, Kino said, keep him quiet. What is the matter? Wana asked. I don't know. He listened again, an animal light in his eyes, almost as if he's moving on instinct instead of being human. He stood up then silently and crouched low. He threaded his way through the brush towards the road, but he did not step into the road. He crept into the cover of a thorny tree, and peered out or looked out along the way he had come. And then he saw them moving along. His body stiffened and he drew down his head and peeked out from under a fallen branch. What do you think he sees? In the distance, he could see three figures, two on foot and one on horseback. But he knew what they were, and a chill of fear went through him. Even in the distance, he could see the two on foot moving slowly along, bent low to the ground. Now, let's think about that. What, why are they bent low to the ground? Here, one would pause and look at the earth while the other joined them. They were the trackers. They were looking for their tracks, for their footsteps. They could follow the trail of a bighorn sheep in the stone mountains. They were as sensitive as hounds, as sniffing dogs. Here, he and Wana might have stepped out of the wheel rut. And these people from the inland, not from the gulf, these people from inland, these hunters could follow, could read a broken straw or a little tumbled pile of dust. Behind them on a horse was a dark man. And remember, we've talked about this color symbolism. He was a dark man, his nose covered with a blanket. And across his saddle, the saddle on his horse, a rifle gleamed in the sun. Kino lay as rigid as the tree limb, 
He barely breathed, and his eyes went to the place where he had swept out the track. Even the sweeping might be a message to the trackers. He knew these inland hunters. In a country where there was little game, where there was very little to hunt, they managed to live because of their ability to hunt, and they were hunting him. They scuttled or they moved over the ground like animals and found a sign and crouched over it while the horsemen waited. The trackers whined a little, like excited dogs on a warming trail. They're, they're making that like excited dog whine. Pino slowly drew his big knife to his hand and made it ready. He knew what he must do. If the trackers found the swept place, the place that would indicate where Juana and Coyotito were, he must leap for the horseman, kill him quickly, and take the rifle. That was his only chance in the world. And as the three drew nearer on the road, Kino dug little pits with his sandaled toes so that he could leap without warning. He dug his feet in so that his feet would not slip. He had only a little vision under the fallen limb. Now Juana, back in her hidden place, heard the pad, the sound of the horse's hooves, and Coyotito gurgled. He made that baby noise again. She took him up quickly and put him under her shawl and gave him her breast. So he's breastfeeding, and he was silent. When the trackers came near, Kino could see only their legs and only the legs of the horse from under the fallen branch. He saw the dark, horny feet, so they're, they're like hard, almost like the horn of, a, of an animal. The, the feet of the men and their ragged white clothes, and he heard the creak of leather of the saddle and the clink of spurs which are the metal uh, spikes on the back of the boots the trackers stopped at the swept place this is what Kino was worried about and studied it and the horseman stopped the horse flung his head up against the bit and the bit roller clicked under his tongue and the horse snorted so the horse is just kind of making horsey noises and moving its head around then the dark trackers turned and studied the horse and watched his ears. Think about how maybe sometimes animals are a little more sensitive than humans. Maybe they're looking to the horse to sense Kino. Kino was not breathing, but his back arched a little, and the muscles of his arms and legs stood out with tension, and a line of sweat formed on his upper lip. For a long moment, the trackers bent over the road, and then they moved on slowly, studying the ground ahead of them and the horseman moved after them. The trackers scuttled along, stopping, looking, and hurrying on. They would be back, Kino knew. They would be circling and searching, peeping, stopping, and they would come back sooner or later to his covered track. Oh my goodness, you guys. <sighs> Juana and Coyotito are safe. They didn't, they didn't find them. But not for long. They're coming back sooner or later. He slid backward and did not bother to cover his tracks. He's in a rush. He could not. Too many little signs were there. Too many broken twigs and scuffed places and displaced stones. And there was a panic in Kino now. A panic of flight. He wants to, to run away, to flee. The trackers would find his trail. He knew it. There was no escape except in flight, except for in running. He edged away from the road and went quickly and silently to the hidden place where Juana was. She looked at him in question. Trackers, he said. Come. And then a helplessness and hopelessness swept over him, and his face went black, and his eyes were sad. Perhaps I should let them take me. Instantly, Juana was on her feet, and her hand lay on his arm. You have the pearl, she cried hoarsely. Do you think they would take you back alive to stay, say they had stolen it? She thinks that as soon as they find the pearl, what's gonna, what's, what are they going to do to Kino? They're going to kill him. His hand strayed or, or moved limply to the place where the pearl was hidden under his clothes. They will find it, he said weakly. Come, she said, come. And when he did not respond, do you think they would let me live? Do you think they would let the little one here live? Her goading, her pushing struck into his brain. His lips snarled and his eyes were fierce again. Come, he said, we will go into the mountains. Maybe we can lose them in the mountains. And that's where we're going to pause for right now. <laughs>